here we go. Eddie, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're doing these lockdown diaries in place of what we usually do, the long form podcasts. And these are just basically where we're, we're catching up with people um, to find out their, their perspective really on life in lockdown, um, how it's affected them, their career. We spoke to people in different places and different circumstances and we're delighted to speak to you uh, given the position you're in. You're a doctor in your day job and you've got this um, this new brand, this uh, app called uh, Life. So do you want to just start, Eddie, by just uh, talking about those things and, and you know how, it, how it's affected you? Yeah, sure. Um, we'll start with the day job then. Um, so it's been it's been strange in terms of workload. You got to remember the NHS is at max capacity all the time. So as we started seeing an influx of COVID patients, we kind of put a hold on. Uh, so I was I've just finished surgery. So I was on uh, bladder and renal surgery for about the past seven months. Mm. Um, but we 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 put a hold on all of the called elective surgeries, so all the pre-planned surgeries, we put a hold on them because we didn't want people coming in and potentially catching COVID. So we put a hold on the ones that we could and we kept it for emergencies and, and like cancers, that kind of thing. Um, so there was, a, there was a strange window where we weren't actually that busy in terms of workload because, because we're at max capacity all the time. It was, it's so intense. It was almost an in, it was more relaxed job, so it was strange. Um, but with that came, it, I mean, it was scary as these COVID patients were coming in because we had literally no PPE. We had gloves and, and a penny. Um, so you, you, a penny is just like like an apron. You know, you'd, you'd, you have like a kitchen apron. It's plastic. So it, it doesn't take anything more than common sense to realize that all of your arms are uncovered. You know, if, if you touch anything in the room, like your back or your shoulders or your neck or your face, you, you, we had no protection. And this was when the disease wasn't well understood at all. And, you know, it was scary times going into these rooms. You just like, you didn't, you didn't really know what you're getting yourself in for. Hardly any data on it. And uh, like we did see a lot of staff going off because th there was no protection. And unfortunately, we've had a few staff die at Wiston and um yeah it's it has it's been it's been a strange process fortunately I'm I'm quite young and um I'm, I'm relatively healthy so I'm not at a huge high risk group but you never we just don't know how COVID's going to hit people so I was still and still am now of course trying to protect myself um but you know now it is it's it, it's it's really good um the PPE is pretty much spot on um so i'm now on a full-time covid palliative uh, palliative ward so it's like end of life care um as you know it's been very hot recently it's been like what 25 degrees um and i've got this like boiler suit on. i look like walter white honestly or a minion off despicable me or something it's, it is it's funny um but yeah it's like it is so hot you've got this thing on you've got your goggles on your mask you got your hood up, all your gloves, and like, okay, some tasks are quite coarse. Let's say if you're moving a patient from bays, or, but then when you like, when you're close in on a patient, you're trying to get the blood, or you're trying to put a line in, or when you're that hot, you are dripping with sweat, and obviously your, your mask is just so steamy. You know, like when, when you're in a car and it and it's raining on the motorway or something. Mm. Say if you leave your wipers off for too long and it's streaming with water, you can start seeing again. So this was, so I was just like, I was letting my goggles steam up that much. They were just dripping with water. And I was just looking through this like <laughs> waterfall of water. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's, it's all good fun, but it's, it is, it's a privilege working with the staff. I think everyone's adapted to the job really well. And um, seeing how flexible the NHS is and the way we have adapted as, as teams, it is amazing. So, well, congrats to you. You've done an incredible job. And um, it, as I say, it's, it's great to speak to somebody who's on the front line. I personally have I had the virus just before lockdown, uh, literally the week before. Um, me and my partner, who's uh, also a mental health nurse, I work in healthcare oh, and, and um, you know, we, we had it when, like you say, there was no information on it. And it was so sketchy then because the, the country wasn't in lockdown. 
there was a lot of, I guess, denial, a lot of fake news out there and stuff. And even even calling one 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 at the time, you know, the thinking back now, the the advice was, have you got a new cough? And then have you got a fever? Well, actually, for, yeah. for us both, the cough didn't come till a few days later. I had this horrendous fever on day one, and I was actually with Greg during the day. As I said, I've just moved house yeah. before, um, and he was helping me move stuff in. I was doing most of the work, obviously, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and then that, that night I got this horrendous fever. So for us, it's always felt very, very real. We've then had to go back after our isolation period, and we thankfully got better. Uh, we've gone back into our respective roles in healthcare, and we've seen, you know, the impact it's had. Um, do you know what? Actually, on the ground there, Eddie, in the hospital. So you're at Wiston, aren't you, Wiston Hospital? Yeah. What what's what's morale like amongst the staff? Um, up and down, to be honest. It's um, I think when 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 staff were going off and catching the virus. One of our one of our orthopedic surgeons died, and uh, he was paraded around the, the 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 roundabout. So the hearse came, and everyone stood outside like, clapping. I think it, that was kind of like the peak at which people were like, you know, this is hitting home. But um, you know, we're always at risk, as as you know, working in the field, we're always at risk of of infectious diseases. Uh, sharp stick injuries you know we're always at risk of catching something it's it's just now that it's a big pandemic people have realized actually that frontline staff are frontline staff but you know it's 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 always the case so it a lot of the staff are very rational and they pr approach the work in a very pragmatic way so you know and, and we, we we safeguard people at risk with this, um, we have we triage staff members to so say if they've got an at risk family member at home, we ensure that um, they're either moved away from um, high intensity COVID areas or we, we, we make sure that they've got full PPE or you know, we put measures in place to ensure that they are safeguarded as much as possible. And if they don't feel comfortable working, then that's absolutely fine. Um, we, we, we can repost them, but what you built on there about um. Did did you say that you you were still working? Then you got the you got the virus. You got the cough. Was was that right? No. So John Day. It was Monday the sixteenth of March, exactly a week before the lockdown, and I just felt fine all day. Felt a bit tired in the evening, and then I just oh felt really really cold and got this like really bad fever where I was my teeth were shattering. I was in bed with a t shirt, pants, hoodie under the covers and just couldn't get um, couldn't get warm it was freezing um and then which it was quite scary for my partner as well um you know it was sort of lying next to me it was like what's going on here um and then about an hour two hours later i was stripped bollico because because i was sweating and there was me my bed was wet with sweat um and yeah. the following morning uh, even then you know she was like she was on google and stuff um she was like, I wonder what this is. We didn't really click on it. It was coronavirus. Um, because I think that was only towards the end of that week, maybe. The country maybe started taking it a little bit seriously because other countries had gone into yeah. lockdown and were going. And I think Ireland went at some point that week. Holland went into lockdown on the Friday. So, um, I, I mean, if we got it now, we've said this since, if we got it, you know, sort of later or at the peak, it would have been much scarier because we'd, we'd have seen so many people die. And it's getting to that stage, yeah. especially you, Eddie, Everyone kind of knows someone or knows someone who knows someone who sadly passed away. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting story, that, because I had a similar situation with my dad. He, he His story was kind of similar to that. And before lockdown happened, um, I, I was trying to... I wasn't seeing my family because I knew that working in hospital, I could be a risk to them. But I... We, I was just like, we're getting on a Zoom and we've got to safeguard my granddad because the, the, the government didn't lock down the country. And I was just like, he's not, he's 91, he's nearly 92, tons of comorbidities. I mean, he's fully independent by himself. He's doing really well. But like, if he got it, he would die, 100%. So I was like, we've got to make sure that he does not leave the house. And he was being naughty, still going out and stuff, but what can you do? Um, but we, we've got to make sure that we safeguard him as much as possible. I just, I just think it's, it's mad that we didn't lock down earlier. But um, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because when, when you talk about you got the virus um, the next day and you, you're feeling terrible, 
if we look at like the incubation period of coronavirus, it, on average, it's around four to five days, but it can span anywhere up to 10 days. So the incubation period is like, as I'm sure you know, working in the field, uh, but if, for anyone listening, the incubation period is the point at which you're pre-symptomatic. So it's before you develop any symptoms. And when we've done studies um, looking at viral load, so when, you're, when you've got viral load is how much virus is in you at any one point. Um, your viral load is highest before you develop any symptoms, which is, which is petrifying because you think like, um, I, I think it's like, four, it was 44% of all infections are spread before you even know you've got it. And that's why it spread so fast because the viral load in people was unbelievably high before they had any symptoms. So like it was just spreading like wildfire and nobody had a clue. So, and we, we, we actually kind of knew this information from Wuhan, but we did nothing about it. I just, I just anyway. It, it, we, it, we kind of lived that, Greg and I, because we, we were together all day that day and I got those horrendous symptoms. I then developed uh, the worst headaches I've ever had in my life from like the back of my neck over to my eyebrows. Mm -hmm. um, my wife was the same. And then we developed the cough later on. And all that week, I was in re regular contact with Greg saying, this has to be coronavirus. Obviously, I didn't know at the time because they weren't testing anybody. In fact, I mean, you look back at it now, it's ridiculous. We spoke to 111 um, pretty much every day that week. And they, their exact words to us were, we've suspended testing the general public. <laughs> it's, it's no wonder it's hap this has happened. Yeah. Um, but I remember yeah. speaking to Greg saying, how have you not got it? Like, uh, you isolated then, Greg, didn't you, for seven days? Um, and yeah. It's, yeah. It's, so, it's, it's such a head scratcher. It must be um, such a head scratcher for you guys as well. Um, because we, we couldn't wait. We were like, you're bound to get it in the next few days. And, and, and you didn't, Greg, did you? Well, you, you perhaps did, but just didn't show any symptoms. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's, it's, good, it's good that you're self-isolated, you know, it's, it's the guidance. Um, I, feel, I feel bad for 111, to be honest, because they are, they are working hard and just we, the government, unfortunately, didn't provide us the resource in which to test appropriately. So um, it came out in the news, um, what was it, maybe an hour and a half ago now, that we're testing the 20-minute 20 20 minute test. Um, so if we swab somebody now, we're, we're seeing if that works and that, that results come back in 20 minutes. So let's hope that's effective and we can start using that because that'd be brilliant. Do you know when, so many questions on this one, because I just think that your past two months life must have just be, be surreal. I can imagine that doing what you do requires a degree of mental resilience anyway. Mm. But nevertheless, what toll has it taken on you as an individual? And I don't just mean when you're in work witnessing the trauma i mean when you're getting home trying to sleep speak to your friends your family train eat whatever like what's your what's your what's your life being like outside of the woods um i mean it's been hectic that's it's understatement of the year. <laughs> uh, yeah it, it, it has been hectic in terms of emotional effects on me like a couple of years back, I, um, I, I, got, I got really into my own mental health and started looking at ways in which I could look after my mental health and well-being. And it's so much more than just, uh, you know, do some meditation or be mindful. We've got to look after ourselves in a complete fashion. So I... It all started when I was at university, actually. There's quite a bit going on, and I started looking at how I could preventatively like, look after my head. Yeah. So si since that, I I've sort of taught myself, and I'm acutely aware now of where my head's at. Um, even on, like, say if I experience something in work, yeah. I'll try and rationalise it as soon as possible, because unless we deal with problems as we go along, we're, we're just pushing them down into our subconscious and at some point they're going to come up mm -hmm. um then dealing with that all in one go can be very difficult so throughout throughout this time i've just this this is a strange way to to describe it but i i aggressively attack my own mental health in the sense that like i will i will any issues that i experience i will make sure i deal with there and then so i can move forward appropriately uh, perhaps not the best way to deal with it for everybody, but personally, that's what I do. And I found it's been very effective. So 
I mean, if people want to try it and it works for them, great. But yeah, I mean, that's what I've done throughout this process. And um, a lot of it has been around task orientation. So when I wake up in the morning, I will do one simple thing and that's make my bed. Um, get up straight away, I'll make my bed and open my curtains because then I know that's the first task done. And then I'll just start ticking them off. And then I'm like, I know I'll need to check up on my granddad. I know I need to like try and eat well, prep me lunch. Um, I'm running like a business on the side as well. So I'll like get through emails. And then because you've started the day strong, you've, you've ticked off a few tasks. It just goes from there really. Um, so yeah, task orientation has been great. <laughs> With that task orientation, that's something we've spoken about on the podcast, Art, and I know it's something that you try and do as well, isn't it? In, in the morning, you know, when you get up hor- horrifically early, uh, but you try to read and, and do something constructive before you go about your day as well, don't you? Yeah, like I was saying before, I think it, it is a case of start as you mean to go on. If you, if you start on the right foot, you know, I tend to get up and try to read at least half an hour a day um, and then I plan out my day. Not one of them where it's like I write down my tasks for the day because realistically not a lot of people do that. But I just think, OK, I'll sit and have a coffee till this time and then I'll train at this time. Um, and, and I find if you do that, you, you end up having a good day, a productive day. And at the end of the day, you, you feel more fulfilled. Whereas if you don't, you get up late. I personally... Uh, easily beat myself up. I imagine you do as well, Eddie, to, just by lis- listening to the way that you're talking. If I do have a lie in, if I do get a bit lazy, I'll eat myself at the end of the day. And um, so sometimes I think it's listen, let's just do something that future Adam will, will thank you for, you know? Yeah, it's, a ba- it's certainly a balance, isn't it, as well? Because of course we need to relax. Um, but like I try and almost treat my relaxation as a task as well, which may not work for people. You know, if people want to get up and lounge around and have a lazy morning, which I know people love, then great, you do that as well. Um, but, you know, I think I think for me and you, Adam, you know, setting the tasks out and, and knowing, okay, you, you're sort of creating a routine and scheduling. It, that is certainly something that's good for your mental health and well-being. <laughs> Eddie, do you know, obviously there's loads of criticism coming towards the government and stuff now. Um, I, I don't want to sort of tap into your political sphere and your believings and stuff, but there was a fascinating thing happened in um, in Belgium last week. Obviously, as you, as you know, their rate, death rate per 100,000 population is ridiculous. Um, you know, they've only got a, a very small country, but per 100,000, it's, it's insane. And um, the... I don't know whether it's the president or the prime minister, the, the leading, she's a lady, visited one of the hospitals and there's this really powerful image. She, as she's driving in, I don't know if you've seen it, Greg, all the staff are outside yeah. to welcome her, but they, they all turn the back on her, every single one of them. Such is the disillusion wow. w- with her decisions. What's the feeling like for how the government are, are running it? Like, Greg and I sort of have discussed a few times and a few weeks ago, we were saying, well, everyone's a genius with hindsight, let's be honest. But having said that, there are still some huge mistakes. And how do you feel about now starting to ease the lockdown? What What are the anxieties like? It's really difficult, isn't it? Because there's so many factors. I don't know what it's like to run a country. And the only the only comparison that I can can pull is um, when when I'm running the business. Of course, you've got to think about um, long term effects on people's livelihoods as well financially, and. I can't imagine what it would have been like for any government to try and make that call and and balance it between health, economy, and probably the other 50 factors which they've got to think about, which I, I can't even conceive because I'm not knowledgeable enough. So it's, it's so, so difficult to say. In my position, of course, I'd have said, let's lock down immediately and let's make sure that um, we, we safeguard the people. But then I don't know... I don't know enough to, to possibly make that judgment. If we look at um, what's happened in New Zealand, you know, they put lockdown on pretty much straight away, blocked all flights, um, and they, they've had very, very low rates. And mm. perhaps perhaps that was the way to go, where you've, you've I go back to aggression, but like you're aggressively nipping it in the bud and stopping it from happening. And now that they have... Well, they've had very low cases. Uh, they can get the economy back up and running quickly. So 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's really difficult, isn't it? It's, it's so hard to know where they were getting the information from and I just don't know. Um, what has annoyed me actually is a complete lack of PPE. That's been annoying. Um, and also the fact that we didn't stop flight sooner. And that, that absolutely baffles me. That is not a difficult decision. Um, and especially telling, making it, making it absolute law. If you fly back into the country, you self isolate for 14 days. That can't be hard to implement, surely. Even if you get like, you close schools and you open sports halls and you put camp beds in there and you, and you, you know, you space people out and make sure they're two meters apart. Come back, you come back from Spain, you're in there for two weeks, mate. Mm. That, that's not a difficult one, surely. <laughs> I just that was the one that completely baffled me more than anything else, and I'm sure if there's a down the line an inquiry that you'd have to wonder one of the main thrusts is why he throwing Adam and I again keep coming back to this he throw and Gatwick were still very very busy with people coming into the UK well into the pandemic it just doesn't look the, I don't understand it the Liverpool game oh you know, mate. hot spot Madrid oh. was a European hot spot. That's and mad. We flew in here on the Wednesday. That is insane. mad. Absolutely insane. You know what? I, I hate to say it, but I went to the game because I didn't want to miss the game. But equally, I was thinking, this is um, this is this could be rough. This. So I said to my dad, "You're not coming. Like I'm going with a mate because you know he's 65." And I was just like, "I'm I'm not I'm not going with my dad." Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was that was bad. In fact, we had I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but. When when the when coronavirus was first kicking off and we brought the people back from Wuhan and they did go into quarantine because they were definite like definite coronavirus. Um, it up in up in the north here we've got you know the, the tropical school of medicine, uh, but Arrow Park as well. It, we're kind of like a hotspot for infectious diseases, um, and we have really good quarantine facilities in Arrow. Um, but the, so we were meant to get all the patients in there. We had one of them turn up to our A and E, and um, I was on lunch with the with, with the, med, the the medical registrar on call that day, and we were just in the doctor's room, and she gets this call in, and um, someone from A and E saying, "Oh, we've got one of the Wuhan coronavirus patients down in A and E," and she goes, "Get them out immediately!" Like, what what has happened? <laughs> so I don't know how that happened or why why it happened, but yeah, it's just, that baffled me as well. Completely insane, isn't it? Yeah. Adam, Adam, I do completely understand that. And again, in hindsight, it's so it's easier, isn't it? And like with your point, Eddie, I've never run a country, but certain themes just I can't get my head around. We could go on about the stuff in the Sunday Times about Johnson not going to Cobra meetings when what was happening in Wuhan was emerging and they were getting briefed. Yeah. But. I think the sad thing is, like on a level, is that you've witnessed the absolute impact it's had on on our community and our city and our region, and losing colleagues and things like that. It's just yeah, appalling. yeah, it is. It's terrible, but I think taking some positives from this, people have realised the importance of health and what life means to them. You know, it's um, death is a part of life, and it's something that we will always deal with. But I think seeing such such emphasis on health for such an extended period of time has made people acutely aware of their own health and they're now placing greater emphasis on being healthy which is a great thing you know moving forwards now i think people will strive to be healthier and actually appreciate you know we've got a real sort of um we've got perspective through this we, we we've seen how shit things can be essentially and um what hopefully once things start winding down and go back to normal people will see that actually health's a beautiful thing yeah absolutely do you know what I'm, i always try to be a uh, glass half full kind of guy see the positive in thing in things that i guess being an everton fan all my life i've kind of developed that um you know to, to, <laughs> to, it's a good skill to have it handy as well um but I've got to be honest, I don't hate the lockdown uh, because like like you, Eddie, uh, you know, uh, I juggle multiple things, multiple roles, and it, it was always very easy to go, I haven't got time, whether it's to see your friends or to do something nice or see your parents. 
um, and you just put things off all the time. And the, yeah. the slowdown I've had to like just take time, you know, go back to books that I've half read, which is pretty much every book I've ever read, and finish them. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, my wife's been enjoying doing stuff in the garden, um, all, all that kind of stuff, and catching up on podcasts and watching box sets. So, I feel like th- there are lots of positives we can take from this, and it's it's the, for me, it's just the ability to just slow down and just be in the moment and try yeah. to get away from this sort of instant gratification, you know, uh, type of world that we lived in where everything was on demand, and just just slow down and just you know, you know what that. That's a great point, and I think it's something that um, tech has something to answer for. You know, we we live in a world where it is instant gratification, but like, conve- okay, it, it's like a balance between convenience. Of course, convenience is great, but then when when you apply that across all sectors, you know, social media, I think has a huge amount to answer. You got you go onto your mobile here. And like, let's take Instagram for an example. You got you got somebody posting a picture. You've got like a location tagged. You might have other people tagged. You've got some description there. They might have even posted a video. There's like a whole other world going on within this. And then you scroll and it happens again. So like your brain has got so much stimulus within it. Like your brain's like, whoa, that, like, that, that's a lot of stimulus. You scroll and it keeps going. So what's happening is your brain's getting used to this insanely high level of stimulus that let's let's drop down a level. Let's say we're trying to watch the TV. People can't sit there and watch a film anymore because we're used to this like incredibly high level of stimulus. Let's say we drop down again. We're trying to read a book. People can't engage with the task because the brain's used to this like bah, 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 thing just always in your face. And of course, that, that stems from we, we need stuff conveniently. But like when it goes that far, it's not good for the brain. Hundred percent. That we said it when we were speaking to Joe last week. That we pick on Instagram a bit on this, ironically on, on this because obviously we we use Instagram and try to market the podcast through it. And I know, yeah, you know, use it as well you've with life. To, you've got to though, haven't you? You got you got to use your resources, but exactly. And it's not fundamentally and inherently a bad thing. But the prevalence of it is, and what you've just described then, I'm acutely aware of my, I, I love films, I love reading, but really love films. And my own quality of watching a film has eroded since, like, as smartphones have got better. Yeah. When I used to work in a newspaper, they called it uh, second screening. And it'd be people would be watching a film, but then they'd be tweeting about it, or they might be on Facebook commenting about it. Right. Now people are like third screening things, you know, and it's just insane. Yeah. One thing I've enjoyed doing is, like Adam said, it's just, and I say enjoy doing it because it's a work in progress. I'm having to retrain. Just watch one thing. I'm not thinking about updating a story, a vacuous story about on Instagram that I'm doing the thing, but just do it. Mm. And it's, 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 it's maddeningly difficult. That's the thing, isn't it? It's about trying to create that balance. I hope that we don't go back to the same sort of levels that we were at because it was, it was getting way out of hand. And I, I'm a little bit concerned about where we're moving to, to be honest, with the likes of AI and augmented reality. You know, um, people are going to be placed in this whole of the world. That that level of stimulus for the brain is so large, and um, you can't you can't live within that environment. Um, you you know, you've got to come out and eat, sleep. I don't know, go to the toilet. You know, basic human functions. You can't live in this world. You know, and, and we've seen, even with video games, we've seen people who have committed suicide because they've wanted to live in that world. Mm. You know, especially um, free roam games like uh, Grand Theft Auto, Oblivion, uh, you know, like, you know, Skyrim, these like um, the Elder Scrolls games where they're very immersive, beautiful worlds. People want to live in that because it's like, it's like a fantasy. And it's like the Avatar fact that, in real life, isn't it? The film Avatar in real life. Yeah, yeah, literally. And it's just I'm a little bit scared to see to see where we're moving. So coming back a little bit, I just I just hope when we start picking up again, people appreciate that actually taking time for yourself is important. Um like if I go to the park and have a run, I might stop halfway round like at Sefton, I'll stop halfway round and walk, do a lap of the lake and just chill out, headphones out, 
no noise, no nothing, and just chill, just completely chill. Um, What's that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you got you, you know, you got to go up and down. You got to be able to just sink into it and just relax. Yeah, I, th- I think also when there's so much emphasis on like broadcasting or documenting your life as well. Uh, Greg and I have discussed this before about like people would go to a concert right and they'd pay a fortune, say like 100, 190 quid something like that to be at the front of a and a real right. artist's concert, whether it's Elton John, Drake, or whoever, somebody who's huge. And they spend the whole concert filming it. Yeah. They're watching it through the through the, the film. But first of all, no one wants to watch your shitty, wobbly, poor sound quality footage anyway. No one wants to watch it, right? They'd rather just go on YouTube and see the fucking concert. But also, yeah. you, you're not you're not getting the enjoyment because you're not you're not immersing yourself in the live yeah. spectacle. You you you're just yeah, looking yeah, at your yeah. phone. You know, yeah. uh, so I, I, I do hope that there's those amongst other things that we take out of this as a positive and maybe as a society we're just not as i don't know whether spoiled's the right word but maybe it is because everything is so convenient for us that we've never we've, we've now had our liberty taken away maybe we'll appreciate those simple little things just a little bit more yeah yeah hopefully it's it's strange isn't it the psychology of it so we're very social animals you know like this is what separates us from other animals our social constructs are so strong that it's it's allowed us to build communities and progress as the human race um like homo sapiens uh, the wise man the the thing that separated us from say neanderthals or the other types of um human races has been the ability to form strong social constructs so this is this is something that we we deeply desire as humans we have to have strong social relationships and with the likes of social media and it's all being very superficial and virtual we don't engage on there's a lot to be answered for in terms of like energy and relationships between people but it certainly does exist just we can't quantify it yet and it is coming out we're looking at brain waves and we can start looking at um, how we're interacting with other people but having something on a mobile so superficial and so virtual like we, we are seeking that 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 social social proof essentially you know having strong relationships and friendships with people is very important to our identities and um with social media there's always going to be something out there that you're going to view and you compare humans compare because we're competitive as well of course we have to strive to survive and drawing natural um comparisons with people is a defense mechanism to ensure that we survive but when you put this on a platform where you're comparing things such as status or who's having the most fun and you don't necessarily know these people, it might be like celebs or Insta- what are they called influencers on Instagram. You're directly pulling comparisons with those people. And then you start thinking, Oh, this is the norm. I'm going to start doing this. And then people start living these completely virtual lives without any strong social construct relationships with people, real life relationships. And we wonder why our mental health's bad. Like, you don't have to think about it too hard to realise that actually this isn't very good for us. Hundred yeah, percent. People are literally ignoring and even making an absolute idiot of themselves in real life to impress people they don't even know. Yeah, but like, just engage with it. Engage with what you're doing because it's very fun. Even if you're cooking dinner, like. Cooking food's an enjoyable process if you engage with it properly. Like, we can do so. I don't care if you're chopping your hedge in your garden. Enjoy it. Like, enjoy the process. Uh, that's another point, actually, isn't it? Like, we view things as um, a means to an end. Like, we are like, oh, I want to get to point B. I just want to get to point B. And at point B, I think I'll feel this way. It's like, no. It's just not, it's not good. If you get your new job promotion, I'm going to feel X. Not necessarily. If if I get a hundred thousand pound job, I'm going to feel X. No, not necessarily. Like, or even on the drive to work, you you go to work, you're like, oh, I just got to get to work. Look out the window, enjoy the drive, control the car, like in whatever it is for you. Listen to your music, just enjoy the process. It's it's enjoyable. <laughs> It, feel, it feels like the, the, what we're discussing is it makes such sense because the messages that are like inherently true, aren't they? All these things that go back to traditions of not just to say Buddhism, but very kind of truisms that, that you know, about being present, 
about appreciating the process, like you say. Yeah. But they've been lost somewhere along the way. And I know like they're being repackaged in different ways. I'd be interested to know. I mean, we'd love to, we'd love to get you back on the podcast in normal circumstances in the studio in the future. Yeah, but just to know what you, how you're trying to apply these things to your mm. business. Because as you said, you're trying to juggle a not, a not insignificant task of treating COVID patients and uh, managing to have a social life and live still and then look after your family and then run this business. So what's that about? Uh, yeah, so one of, my, one of my big gripes with society really is that we've been talking about mental health awareness now for pretty much the past decade. And I haven't personally seen much change. Uh, mental health awareness in itself is 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 a start and it's certainly good um, and we talk we talk about uh, people's anecdotes people's stories which is fantastic and it certainly serves a place because what we like to know is that somebody who's experiencing a, a form of depression let's say if a story is there that they can relate to that person knows that they're not alone and they're like okay you know Somebody else has gone through this, a similar set, a similar set of scenarios, and I can get through this. And it's inspirational in that way. But that's mental health awareness. Then we have like the treatment side. So let's say you're diagnosable. Diagnosing mental health problems in itself is a problem because it's it's a, a set of criteria and symptoms, and uh, there's a huge gray area in it. And it comes down to things such as. Um, the clinician's perspective, whether you're hitting certain DSM-4 criteria, it's called, it's very, it's very arbitrary, it's strange. But let's say on that side of things, we treat medically depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, and that's kind of like a binary process. It's like, when do you cross that line of now you have a problem? You know, it's not, this is not a binary thing. It's not like no mental health problem, mental health problem, now we're gonna treat you. This isn't binary, it, you know, mental health is a spectrum, as is physical health. We, we sit on a spectrum. In fact, complete health is a spectrum. Complete health comprises physical health, psychological health, and social health. They're your three key domains. And it's not like now you're just in that bracket. It's, it just doesn't exist. So you have mental health awareness, which, it, which certainly has its place, and, and, and treatment, which again has its place. But what's happening in the middle? I'm not seeing too much happen in the middle. Why don't we stop people from slipping off the slope, let's say? You know, if, if, you, if you treat the mind as a leg, what's happening is we're talking loads about broken legs, but we're letting people break the legs, and then we treat the broken leg. Would it not be better if we educate people how to stop breaking the leg? Say if everyone was walking around those streets, smacking the legs on lampposts because we weren't, a, it's a silly example, but because we didn't know that that broke legs, we'd tell them, don't do that because you'll, and you'll stop breaking your leg. So with the business, what we're trying to do is we're trying to educate people about things they can do to stop them slipping off that slope, to stop them breaking their legs. Um, so yeah, that's that's the whole ethos of of life as we life with a Y is our, our brand. Um, it's plugging the really gap between awareness and treatment. Sounds sounds really interesting, Eddie. You, you'll definitely have to come back and and, and do a face to face. And what you're basically saying is prevention is better than cure. And I guess like your example with the breaking the leg isn't a bad bad example because my, my wife have said before is a mental health nurse, so we talk about this a lot because it's easier to break a leg because you can see it, you know, and, and, yeah. that, and, that, and yeah. that, I guess, is, therein lies the problem, doesn't it? So, uh, yeah. so we'll wrap it up now because we've got the clap for carers soon and I don't want the internet to go off again. But thanks so much for your patience, Eddie. Eddie, thank you. It, it's been super interesting and we'll have to have a sit, face-to-face sit down with you um, for a long-form podcast and maybe when we're allowed to hug and shake hands again in the, in the hope yeah, of the distant future. Nice one. Thanks for your time, Jen. See you, buddy. Bye. 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 Thank you.